tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. <laughs> Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's program, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with audio adaptations of three rounds of frightening fiction about antagonized artists, sinister skies, and post-traumatic paranoia. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring our frightening fiction to life are voice talents Danielle Hewitt, Adam Dergeman, and AJ Ferraro, all of them top performing contestants and third round competitors in Chilling Tales for Dark Nights' latest Evil Idol Horror voice acting competition. If you enjoy their performances tonight, visit our YouTube channel and vote on theirs and the other entries in the competition. The third round, with its 10 competitors, has just seen its final entries posted this past week. And there's still time to vote and help decide who advances to the fourth round. So check out our channel and join in the deliciously dark fun yet to come. And be sure, of course, to participate in the final round starting mid-May to help us crown our latest champion. Again, you can find Chilling Tales for Dark Nights in the Evil Idol competition on YouTube. Just search Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube on any search engine or visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click the Evil Idol link on the navigation to see a current roster, contestant profiles, and links to all of the performances thus far. We and the candidates appreciate your support. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs> Our first tale tonight is both written by author Ryan Peacock and performed by Evil Idol 2019 contestant number 18, Danielle Hewitt. It's the critically acclaimed story of a talented young artist tormented by her peers that lends credence to the old adage that the pen is mightier than the sword. Without further ado, I present to you Space Girl. We called her Space Girl. Her real name was Megan Daniels, but nobody actually called her that. She'd been Space Girl since grade two. She was the kind of kid who stuck out in the crowd with her long red hair, ghostly pale skin, and Coke bottle glasses. For as long as I'd known her, Space Girl had been quiet. She didn't like to be around us. She didn't play with us when we were kids. She didn't even talk much. Most of the time, she'd find somewhere to sit, far away from everyone else. Then she'd open up her little notebook and scribble inside. Sometimes she wrote poems, sometimes she drew. But she was always off in her own little world. Nowadays, I understand why we targeted her. She was different, and she was alone. That doesn't justify any of it, but kids can be cruel. 
I remember that it was Sasha Brown who told me that Space Girl was retarded because her mother was on drugs. She probably just made that up, but we all believed it. She'd always been the worst towards Space Girl, and she kept that up until the end. It all started in grade five when Sasha took her notebook. It had been raining that day, so we had had indoor recess. Space Girl sat in the corner at her desk, eyes focused on her notebook as she methodically worked on a drawing. Sasha and I had been sitting nearby at our desks, and we simply just watched her do her thing. I can't believe they let that retard sit with us, Sasha murmured. Look at her. Why do they even let them in school? They aren't going to learn anything. Better than leaving her at home with her crackhead mom, said Tanya Everett. She and I weren't exactly friends, but she sat close to Sasha and I. My dad says he sees a different car in front of our house every day. He says that she lets the boys come and they pay her so they can have S-E-X. None of us could actually say the dreaded S-word at the time. Sex was a terrible unknown thing, and we'd all been raised to believe that nobody decent would ever do it. Space Girl paused, and her eyes darted away from her book to look at us. I can only imagine she heard us. Sasha just stared right back at her. What? Do you have a problem, Space Girl? She asked. The teacher was out of earshot, and that gave her carte blanche to say whatever she wanted. Space Girl didn't respond. She just looked back down at her notebook. But Sasha had been challenged, or at least she thought she'd been. She looked over to the teacher's desk to make sure she was busy, and then got up and moved closer to Space Girl. What are you even doing in there, retard? She reached out to snatch the book before Space Girl could stop her. What even is this? A unicorn? <laughs> what are you, five? She handed me the book, and I took it on instinct. There was a brightly colored drawing of a unicorn inside. The artwork was actually pretty nice, but I would never have said so. The book was passed on to Tanya next, and Space Girl could only look at us helplessly. Wow, you can't even draw. Look at this. She tore the page out of the notebook and Space Girl let out a startled whimper, as if she'd been struck. The picture was crumpled up and the book was thrown on the floor by Space Girl's desk. Draw something that isn't trash next time, Tanya said. And Sasha just giggled, as if it was anything other than being mean-spirited just for the sake of it. Space Girl slowly picked her book up off the floor, avoiding eye contact as Tanya and Sasha turned away from her. I continued to stare. I remember the way she moved. I was so defeated as if she was shrinking in on herself. She looked up at me, but only for a moment. And I felt really bad for her. I really did. But I didn't do anything about it. I just left her to rejoin the others. After that, Space Girl became an easy target for Sasha and Tanya. Every chance they got, they'd harass her. And I regret to admit that I was usually right there with them. During the days when we could go outside for recess, Space Girl would always sit beneath the same tree, always working in her notebook. When she did, we would always lean on the trunk and look over Space Girl's shoulder. Wow, that's really good, Space Girl, was how most of her comments would start. Did you mean to draw it like it got hit by a truck, or is that just your style? There was never a compliment. She would always find something to needle. Can you draw me? Sasha asked once. I heard that retards were like art geniuses or something. Maybe it'll even look like a person. Space Girl didn't look up at her. She seemed to be trying not to acknowledge the insults. I won't pretend like I was blameless either. I never stopped them. And there were plenty of times where I was right there making fun of her, because that was what we did. And we weren't the only ones. More or less, everyone hurt her in some way or another, but she never complained. I think she was too scared to. 
It was late December in seventh grade, where things got even worse. I don't know all the details, and I don't know just for how long things have been boiling over, but I'd heard a rumor that James Hardy had it out for Space Girl. James had only been in my class a few times, and he wasn't in my class that year. He was a small, mousy-looking kid who was convinced that he was the world's toughest gangster. The rumor said that someone had seen his dad going into Space Girl's house. Naturally, there had been speculation that they'd been having sex. Someone told me that James' parents had been divorcing because of it. Somehow, all of these rumors had mutated into claims that James and Space Girl were dating, and I think that was what rubbed him the wrong way. We were coming in from recess when some boys decided to pull a little prank on James. The whole prank had been set up by Brian Jordan and his brother Mike. They had some mistletoe from the holiday season, and had set it up in the hall leading back to our classroom. Mike had grabbed Space Girl during recess, and were holding her behind the door where the mistletoe was. When James walked through, they pushed her at him and snapped a picture. I'd been just behind James when it happened. I watched as Space Girl came flying out of seemingly nowhere, eyes wide and afraid, then slammed into James. They both hit the ground and I can hear the other boys laughing. Look, she wanted to give you a kiss, one of the boys said. Space Girl was trying to crawl away from James and pick up her notebook, but somebody had kicked it out of her sight. I remember that she looked back toward James, and there were tears in her eyes. She must have been terrified with everything that was going on. She clearly hadn't wanted any part of this, but there she was at the center of it. You fucking faggot assholes, James yelled as he picked himself up. Hey, she just wanted to give you a smooch, laughed Brian. Come on, give her a kiss. Someone pushed Space Girl towards James, and he glared at her as if this was all her fault. She tried to stand and run, but he was angry and wasn't thinking straight. I watched as he grabbed her and hit her. A square punch to the jaw. Then he tossed her to the ground and went after Brian next. A teacher had to get in to pull James off of him. He, Space Girl, and Jordan Brothers ended up getting suspended right before the Christmas holidays. We didn't see Space Girl until January. We didn't see James or his friends, ever again. On Christmas Eve, there was a car accident on the highway outside of town. Supposedly, it had swerved off the road to avoid an animal of some sort and gone into a ditch. Mike, Brian, and their parents didn't survive. On December 27th, James was killed while outside shoveling his driveway. My parents told me he'd been attacked by an animal. Probably a deer or something. But that seemed so unusual. I've never heard anything about a deer attacking people before, especially not in my area. I went over to Sasha's house on the day before New Year's. We'd both gotten some gift cards for Christmas, and we were planning to walk to the mall together to use them. Her parents weren't home, they both had to work. So it was just us when I got there. Hey, kept me waiting, she said when I knocked on the door. Sorry. It's fine, I'll be ready in a minute. Come on upstairs, I want to show you something. I didn't question what it was. I figured it was just something she'd gotten for Christmas, so I went upstairs with her. You're gonna love it, she promised me. It's gonna be so funny. She led me to her bedroom, and as soon as she opened the door, I spotted a familiar notebook on her desk. Where did you get this? I asked, walking closer to it. Space Girl dropped it when Brian and his brother pulled that prank the other day. She dropped it. I may have grabbed it, you know, just for safekeeping. She cracked a wry grin before opening the notebook. Look at this. She's been drawing the same damn unicorns forever. She didn't even finish this one. She paused at one small picture that was labeled the Unicorn Prince. It depicted an empty field with a blank space where the print should have been. Sasha flipped through the pages a little more until she got to the newer ones. I figured, since they kicked Space Girl out for a little while, and her mom is too poor to get her anything for the holidays, I'd step up. What do you think? 
Sasha wasn't anywhere near as good as an artist as Space Girl was. But the simple detail in what she had drawn turned my stomach. In her first picture, Space Girl was hanging from a rope. Her tongue was hanging out and her eyes were closed. In the second one, Space Girl had a gun in her mouth. In the third one, she was standing on the edge of a building. Sasha giggled as I flipped through her crude depictions of suicide. There were pages of them. What do you think? She asked with a grin. I'll bet she'll lose her shit. I closed the notebook and looked over at Sasha. Are you out of your mind? I asked. Sasha's grin faded. What do you mean? You stole her notebook just so you could draw these? Sasha, that's really messed up. It's Space Girl. Who the hell cares about Space Girl, Jane? You... you just drew her killing herself over and over again. I took the book off her desk. Do you not understand what's wrong with that? Sasha just stared at me like I was crazy. Fine. Sue me for trying to be funny, Sasha said. Just give it here. She outstretched a hand to take the notebook, but I pulled it back from her. No. You're just gonna put something else in there. Anger flared in Sasha's eyes. Jane, give me the book. No! I opened the book, and I started to tear out those pages of Space Girl's suicide. Sasha lunged for me, trying to grab the book and stop me, but I pushed her back. I didn't mean to push so hard, but I did, and she fell, landing hard on the ground. For a moment, Sasha looked up at me, wide-eyed and shocked. I don't think anyone had ever laid a hand on her like that before. Then I saw something in her eyes. Not just anger, something worse. It was the same thing that had prompted her to draw those horrible pictures of Space Girl. I turned and I ran, bolting down her stairs and out the front door back into the snow. I clutched Space Girl's notebook to my chest the entire time and I didn't let it go till I got home. I spent the rest of Christmas break terrified that my parents would get a call from Sasha's. I'd pushed her, and that seemed like a big deal at the time. In hindsight, I doubt Sasha would have even told her parents what happened. They would have to ask why I pushed her, and I would have told them about the notebook. On some level, she must have known that what she'd done was wrong. She was a cruel person, but there was a limit. Part of me hoped that she'd realize that I was right, and we could patch things up when school started again. But honestly, I wasn't so sure. I remember looking through Space Girl's drawings, the ones that she'd done. I remembered the ones I'd made fun of the most. There was one with a mermaid on a rock combing her hair. Her eyes were closed in a relaxed bliss. I remembered saying how stupid her facial expression had looked, but honestly, I kinda liked it. I flipped through the pages some more, through unicorns, fairies, and castles. But I paused at the page depicting the unicorn prince. Back at Sasha's place, it had been blank. But at my house, it was finished. The unicorn prince stood proudly in his field, looking skywards with his horn proudly displayed. Maybe I'd been thinking of a different picture. I brushed it off and flipped back to where Sasha's pictures were. One by one, I started tearing them out of the notebook and tossing them in the trash. It was a waste of paper, but I refused to give it back to Space Girl with those images still in it. On the first day back to school, I was up early. I made sure the notebook was packed in my bag and was out as early as I could be. The snow on the ground was almost pristine as I walked to school, but I remembered seeing some tracks on my lawn, headed down the side of my house deep U-shaped indents that looked like they'd been made by hooves. A deer, perhaps? I didn't dwell on them, and made my way down the freshly shoveled sidewalk and back to school. I wasn't entirely sure if Space Girl would be back yet, but she was. She was alone in the classroom, sitting at her desk and drawing in a brand new notebook. She paused briefly when I walked in to join her, and I could see her side-eyeing me. She didn't say a word as I grew nearer, but I thought I saw her shoulders tense up ever so slightly. 
Hey, I said. I'm... I hope you had a nice holiday. She didn't respond. I'm sorry about what happened the other day. I didn't know anything about it, but it just seemed really mean-spirited. Still no answer. I reached into my backpack, taking out her old notebook. I put it on her desk in front of her. She stared at it, still silent, then back at me. Sasha took it. I was over at her house the other day and she showed it to me. I, um, had to take some pages out, but she drew some really awful things in there. I didn't think it would be right to give it back to you with those things in there. I paused, feeling smaller as Space Girl just stared at me. She didn't seem angry or thankful. She didn't seem anything at all. Just stoic. I'm sorry if I wasn't all that great to you before. I said, and then shuffled off to my desk. Space Girl waited until I sat down before she opened her notebook and inspected it. Then she closed her new notebook and started something on a new fresh page in her old one. It wasn't much, but it made me feel at least a little good for what I'd done. When Sasha got in, she didn't talk to me. She didn't even look at me. Neither did Tanya or any of our other mutual friends. I knew from the moment they walked in that I'd burn my bridges with them. I still wanted to try. The teacher hadn't come in yet, so I figured it might be worth it to try to talk to Sasha. I got up to move closer to her and she gave me a look of utter disgust. What do you want? She spat. Now it was my turn to be silent. Fuck off and leave us alone, Tanya said. You'd obviously rather hang out with the fucking retard than us. And I really don't want you spreading your retard germs to us. It's a quarantine issue. I stared at both of them. And I could have sworn I knew how Space Girl felt. What was I supposed to say to any of that? Instead, I just returned to my desk without a word. Space Girl stared at me the entire time. Her pencil rested over her notebook, but she didn't write anything. She set it down, tore out the page she'd been writing on, and jammed it in her pocket. I later saw her toss it in the trash during lunch. I didn't really have anyone left, so I thought maybe it'd be a good idea to pull it out. Maybe it was something she wasn't happy with. I'd never seen her throw a drawing out before. I was thinking that maybe I could use it as a peace offering of sorts, or something along those lines. When I saw what she'd written on it, I almost threw it back in the trash. Your words. There is a land where your sorry may go. A sickening land where it always snows. The snow is putrid in color and smell. Its substance filth and things I won't tell. Only your father has been there before. One day your boyfriend will visit once more. This place in your carcass, this humanoid hell. Your sorry can go there to this hole in your shell. My unsubtle message, this subtextual jazz, is take your apology and stuff it up your ass. This was unlike anything I'd seen her write. It was so crass and spiteful. This was as close to hatred as she'd gotten. I understand why she'd thrown it out. It didn't fit with everything else she'd done. Those things had been beautiful despite what people have said to her. This was angry and ugly. This was something she'd written for me put it in my pocket. I wasn't going to give it back to her, but I wanted to keep it. I wanted to remember the way I made her feel. Eighth grade wasn't fun for me. I had very few friends left, and Sasha never forgave me for turning on her. Her version of the story was slowly warped as time went on. First, I'd punched her and stolen the book. Then I'd tried to kiss her, punched her when she refused, then stole the book to try and get her in trouble. Rumors of me being a dyke spread pretty quickly. And hot on their heels came the rumors that I was dating Space Girl. I tried not to let them bother me too much. I knew the truth, and at the end of the day, I'd done the right thing. By the time high school rolled around, I was hoping for a fresh start. There were new faces, and I figured I could make friends with them before Sasha's rumors spread. 
I had a bit of success in that department. I fell in with a better crowd, at least. Sasha stuck with her same old clique. It grew ever so slightly. But she was determined to live out the movie Mean Girls. And most people didn't pay her any mind. Space Girl barely changed at all. I didn't see her much when high school started. She was in a few of my classes, but I rarely saw her outside of them. Whenever she had a moment, she'd be in the library, usually in one of the corner cubicles, working on her drawings. Sometimes I thought about talking to her, to trying to strike up a friendship, but it never felt right. Sasha's bullying never let up, of course. Of course, she stalked Space Girl to the library, where she'd pull the same old shit she'd been pulling since the fifth grade. She'd leer over her cubicle and comment on her drawings, picking them apart like she always had. I stopped her whenever I saw it, but I didn't always see it. Coming to the rescue again, huh, Jane? Sasha asked once when I interrupted her. Tanya leered at me from behind her, chewing gum with her mouth open. What's she ever done to you anyway? I asked. She's just minding her own business. Oh? What's she done to you, dyke? Sasha hissed. She leaned down over her cubicle and looked down at the notebook. Unicorns, 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 fucking unicorns. When are you going to grow up, space girl? Hey, I told you to stop. I rounded the cubicle and I saw Sasha recoil. For a moment, I saw a bit of fear in her eyes. It vanished quickly and was replaced with a familiar rage. Fine, she said. Tan, let's leave the happy couple to their alone time. She pulled away from the cubicle and disappeared with Tanya nipping at her heels like a faithful terrier. Space Girl remained hunched over her notebook, her long red hair spilling over her shoulders. She seemed impossibly still. I turned to leave when I heard, Thanks. I looked back at her and saw that she was looking at me. Um, you're welcome? I said, let me know if she bothers you again, all right? I will, but you're usually there anyways. Her voice was soft and low. I'd heard it before, but I don't remember her ever speaking directly to me. Yeah, well, it's just not right. She's such a child. One of these days, she's going to have to grow up. Space Girl just nodded, looking over toward the library door, then back down at her notebook again. For a moment, I thought about asking her about what she was drawing. I thought about saying something else. But, no, I didn't want to make her uncomfortable. I left her alone again. In tenth grade, I took art as an elective. I wasn't much of an artist, but I figured it would be an easy course. To the surprise of no one, Space Girl was there. I actually asked her to work with me on a few group projects. I think the prospect of being asked to work together was foreign to her. She looked at me suspiciously when I did it, but when she smiled, it was the biggest smile I'd ever seen. I went to her house for the first time to work on a portrait project with her once. We were supposed to take turns drawing portraits of each other, and I'd volunteer to let her draw me first. Rumors of her mother had always surrounded Space Girl. So I wasn't entirely sure what to expect when I got there. I certainly wasn't expecting the quiet, neatly kept house that I found. The woman who answered the door looked like an older version of her daughter, sans the Coke bottle glasses. You must be Jane, she said. She wasn't smiling, but she didn't sound upset either. Yes, ma'am. Come on in. Megan's upstairs. She was just getting ready for you. The house was warm with plenty of knickknacks on the wall. Plates and porcelain dolls, mostly. Her mom sent me upstairs and I didn't waste any time. On the landing leaning up to Space Girl's room, I could see a mural of family photos and paused to look at them. I could recognize Space Girl and her mother in most of them. Space Girl never seemed to be smiling. I only saw her father in a few very early pictures. Space Girl looked like she was a young child in the few pictures I saw with him, though. I didn't dwell long and headed toward what I assumed was her room. The cardboard stars and planets gave it away. Sure enough, she was inside waiting for me. She sat facing the door behind an easel in the center of the room. Her bed was neatly made and tucked away in the corner. She had a clean little desk, 
that she'd clearly been working on and had a chair set out for me to sit on. I hadn't expected something so overwhelmingly formal, and I almost started laughing. But then I noticed her walls. They weren't just covered in drawings. The art pieces on them were full-on paintings. They were the same fantasy depiction she usually did, but the colors were so vivid. The clouds looked like fluffy pillows and the castles seemed great and infinite. Holy shit, are these yours? They are, Space Girl said softly. She stood up and took the plate of cookies from me, then moved it to her desk. It... it's soothing, she said after a while. Painting, I mean. I pick the drawings I like the most, and I finish them. She spoke slowly like she was carefully choosing her words. I almost felt like there was something she was trying to avoid. I spotted a painting on the floor that looked like her father. The style was the same, but the content was different. He was surrounded by awkward scribbles, and he looked completely and utterly terrified. Space Girl looked down at it, but she seemed to disapprove of it. She turned it around so I wouldn't have to look at it. We should get started, she said. Sorry. No, it's all right, I said. I sat in the chair for her. I'd, I'd like to hear about it. Space Girl watched me from the corner of her eye for a moment, as if she doubted I was being serious. But eventually she sat down behind the easel and started to draw. Soon after that, she was talking too. I stayed long after she'd gotten what she needed for her sketch, just to talk. She told me she'd always liked fantasy, and how she liked unicorns because they were simple but pretty. I hung on to every word, and I could have sworn I saw her smiling shyly as we talked. The portrait she'd done of me was something else entirely. Her work had always been beautiful, but this made me look transcendent. I wasn't entirely sure that I was looking at myself at first. There was something about the look on my face. There was a small, almost content smile there. The warmth it conveyed was almost Disney-esque. I, I love it, I told her. That's incredible sp- Megan, that's really great. You can call me Space Girl if you want, she said. I don't mind the nickname. Not as much as I mind the people, at least. My awe quickly turned to shame, but Space Girl didn't look upset. She just stared at me blankly like she so often did. No, not blankly. Her face might not have conveyed much emotion, but there was definitely some emotion in there. I, um... I wish... I wish I had been nicer to you when we were younger. Is that why you're here right now? No, no, I'm here for the assignment. I mean, the art assignment, the, the portraits. She continued to stare. Did you pick me because you felt bad for me? No, I, I just thought it would be cool to work with you. Space Girl didn't react for a moment, but then she just nodded. Okay. Her flat tone made it hard to know what she meant by that. She stood up and walked over to the portrait. Mom can drive you home if you need a ride. I opened my mouth to say something else. I wanted to apologize. But I didn't know what I had done to offend her. Had I said something? Um, alright. Thanks. It was the only thing I could think of. See you tomorrow. With that, I left her. I was almost afraid to see Space Girl the next morning. I drifted through my classes that day until I reached art. And when I did, I wasn't expecting what I saw. She had clearly been up late, but what she'd brought in stole my breath away. It was my portrait, but she'd done more with it than I thought possible. She'd painted over the sketch, turning me into something beautiful. Flowers bloomed around my brown hair, and a crown of daisies, lilies, and chrysanthemums adorned my head. The colors were so vivid, and I looked so at peace in it. Space Girl was looking right at me as I came in, as if gauging my reaction. 
but all I could do was stare wide-eyed and in awe. When I looked back at Space Girl, she was smiling at me. Her project single-handedly netted us an A on the project, and got the privilege of being hung up outside the art classroom. Of course, I told her how much I loved it, and I remembered the way she smiled when I did. I remembered thinking that it was the cutest smile I'd ever seen. My portrait was up for barely even a day before Sasha had to make a comment. I'd been on my lunch and had just gotten some fries from the cafeteria when she and Tanya ambushed me. "'Where's your flower crown, Dyke?' Sasha said. "'Leave me alone,' I said brushing past them, but Sasha was out for blood. "'I always knew you were a little dyke, but now you've posted solid proof of it. "'We've gone and cracked the case, haven't we? So what happened? "'Did you go to her house and lick her retarded little snatch? "'You must have been a real good dyke because she went and drew that for you.' I tried to walk away from her, but Sasha and Tanya just kept following me. What's wrong? Am I not pretty enough for you, Dyke? She snapped at me. Maybe she only fucks retarded girls. I'll bet Space Girl squealed like a pig when she came. I stopped dead in my tracks, and I heard Sasha stop behind me. I don't know what it was about what she said that pissed me off so much but those two had finally struck a nerve. I spun around, swinging my tray as hard as I could. Fries were scattered everywhere. But although I was aiming for Tanya, I hit Sasha. She went down hard. I'm not sure if she was even still conscious when she hit the ground. Tanya was on me in an instant. She slammed me back against the wall and kept me pinned. She had size and strength on me, and there wasn't a thing I could do to stop her. Several other students grabbed at us. A teacher finally got involved, and all three of us were escorted to go see the principal. As we left the cafeteria, I saw a space girl in one of the halls just staring at me. Naturally, I got a three-day suspension, but Tanya and Sasha were fine. Both of them said they'd just been walking and I attacked unprovoked. It was their word against mine. Sasha had a familiar shit-eating grin on as she left the office with only a bruise on her forehead to show for her troubles. There was a familiar look in her eyes. That same anger I'd seen the last time I'd laid a hand on her. Something about that scared me. When I came back to school, I realized I had every reason to be afraid. My portrait was missing. I wondered if they'd take it down because I'd attack Sasha, but the truth is a lot worse. Someone took it, Space Girl said. She was sitting in her usual spot in the library where I found her sketching flowers in her notebook. When? The day after you hit Sasha. I don't think anyone's found it yet. She didn't look up at me. Just stayed focused on her art. She didn't need to say it for me to know who she blamed. Who else would it be? I had half the mind to confront Sasha about it. But I didn't know if that would be a good idea or not. Sasha could easily just cry wolf. I wouldn't put it past her. In the end, it didn't matter. By the time I was headed to art class, the painting was back. But there'd been some modifications to it. The words read, Retard fucking dyke. They had been painted across my portrait in bright red. I saw it from down the hall, and could see some of the other students whispering amongst themselves beneath it. I didn't know what to say or do, but this felt like too much. The picture was taken down quickly, but the damage was done. Sasha had gotten her revenge, and it didn't stop with just the painting. Space Girl looked different than when I'd seen her in the library. She seemed uneasy and her eyes were red like she'd been crying. I'm sorry about the painting, I said softly. She looked at me before sighing. I knew she'd do something like that. I'm so used to it by now that it doesn't bother me anymore. I'm sorry she wrote those things about you, though. But you worked hard on that. I'd be upset, too. She just shook her head. That's not it, she said. She reached into her pocket, pulling out a crumpled up piece of paper she slid over to me. Slowly, I uncrumpled the paper and my eyes widened as I'd recognized what was on it. 
It wasn't the same drawing, but it was close enough. It was the depiction of Space Girl hanging herself, and me beside her, a caption reading, Retard Dyke Wedding. There were so many in my locker, Space Girl said. This is what she drew in your notebook. When I returned it to you, this is what I had to take out. Space Girl looked down at the picture again before averting her eyes. She didn't pay much attention during class. Instead of taking notes, she sketched in her notebook. I looked over a few times to see her drawing another unicorn. This one seemed so similar to the one I'd seen before. She must not have been quite happy with it, though. When I looked back at her notebook, the unicorn wasn't there anymore. She must have erased it. But it seemed so clean, like it hadn't been erased at all. Tanya was following me on my walk home that evening. I didn't know what she had in mind, but I didn't want to put up with it. When I was in the middle of a small walking path that cut behind some of the houses on my street, I stopped and looked at Tanya as she kept approaching. What do you want? I asked. It's a surprise, she said. Sasha and I just want you to know how much we love dykes in this town. Oops, <laughs> I've said too much. I wanted to hit her. Dear God, I wanted to hit her. But we both know she can overpower me. Whatever Tanya had in mind, it wasn't anything good. She drew closer to me, unafraid of anything I'd do. Come on, Dyke. Go home. Let's go check out your surprise. In a sudden horrible moment, I realized that Tanya was threatening me. I also realized that I couldn't outrun her couldn't fight her off. Didn't really have much of a choice but to do as she asked. Slowly I turned and walked toward my house, with Tanya at my heels. It wasn't far, and up ahead I could see Sasha sitting on a park bench. From a distance I recognized the red gas can beside her, and I stopped dead in my tracks. Tanya seized me by the arm and pulled me toward the bench. Sasha just watched with a wide manic grin. Hey Jane. How's it going? What the fuck is this? Just wanted to chat, Sasha said with a cold chuckle. You think you can get away with pulling this shit you did the other day? <laughs> no. You've been treating me like garbage for years. And for what? Because a space girl? You know who you're fucking choosing, right? God, I hate that retarded girl. But you know what? I hate you? Even more. Acting like you're better than me just because you feel bad for her. You're crazy. Sasha just laughed. I'm not the one who clocks someone with a fucking tray just for a little bit of teasing. You're absolutely fucking psycho. On the bench behind her, I saw the portrait that Space Girl had painted of me. Sasha picked it up and tossed it in front of me, then picked up the gas can and dumped it onto the canvas. You want to be a dyke? I don't care. But I'm not letting you and your retarded whore put your shit up. So say goodbye to your little project, slut. Sasha reached into her pocket and took out a book of matches. Her grin widened before suddenly vanishing outright as she looked at something behind us. What the hell? Tanya said, and I craned my neck to see what they were seeing. As for believing it... That was another story entirely. Standing on the path behind us was a unicorn. But the way it looked was all wrong. This was nothing like a regular horse. Its body was plain white and almost textureless, save for the many thin blue lines that ran along its body. It looked like it had been cut out from a sheet of lined paper, but that was impossible. It had to be impossible. Neatly done gray lines defined the shape of the horse. In fact, the lines reminded me of the one Space Girl used. The unicorn looked like it had walked out of one of her notebooks. Tanya let me go and stumbled back a few steps, wide-eyed as she stared at the advancing unicorn. It let out an angry noise before charging straight for Tanya. She panicked and tried to run. In her desperation to escape, she bolted down the path, but she couldn't outrun the paper unicorn. 
It lowered its head as it grew nearer to her, and in one swift moment, the horn pierced Tanya's back, impaling her straight through the chest. She screamed as she was hoisted off the ground and the unicorn circled back to fix Sasha on a murderous glare. Tanya looked down at the massive spike sticking out of her, her eyes clearly wide with horror and her body twitching its last spasm as the life quickly drained from her. The unicorn lowered its head to let her slide off the horn, and she hit the ground in a bundle of limbs. Sasha and I stared in silent horror as the unicorn reared up on its hind legs and brought its hooves down upon Tanya's body. She didn't scream. She didn't fight. She simply lay there as she was trampled again and again. I can only hope she died quickly. Sasha dropped the unlit match and took a slow, terrified step back before toppling over. I stumbled back and looked down to see the portrait of me at her feet. But it had changed. The beautifully painted version of me was now leaning out of the canvas, invading the real world and clutching Sasha's leg tightly. Still with that look of contentment on her face, I watched as painted me slowly slipped back into her painting, and she took Sasha's leg with her. Fuck! 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 Sasha desperately swatted at the painted me, but she couldn't overpower it. She couldn't escape. Her nails tried to dig into the pavement as she was slowly dragged into the canvas. She looked at me in horror, silently begging for me to help, but all I could do was stare at her in silence. Jane! Jane, help! Please! <laughs> Please! The hands of the painted me reached up, seizing Sasha by the hair and forcing her down into the canvas. It was like watching something pull her underwater. One minute she was there, the next she was gone. I stood silent in the park, staring at the painting and then at the paper unicorn. The unicorn huffed before retreating off into the woods, and then I was alone. Slowly, I approached the painting and I looked down at it. It had changed, and now it depicted Sasha. Her mouth opened in a horrified final scream. After some hesitation, I picked up the painting. I could return it to Space Girl in the morning. They chalked Tanya's death up to an animal attack, and nobody ever found Sasha. I never asked Space Girl about what I saw. I don't think even she knew the answer, although she certainly knew much more than I did. High school was ten years ago, though, and I've chosen not to remember as much as I can. I've got my own life now, and I try not to ask so many questions. Sometimes I see paintings move, but I don't bother with the second glance, and I never ask my wife about them. She doesn't like to talk about it, and I won't ever force her. The painting of Sasha hangs in her studio at home, right beside the painting of her father. Sometimes I look at it, and I wonder if maybe things could have been different, but I don't feel too guilty about it. I wouldn't feel too guilty if I heard another story about a suspicious trampling or animal attack either. But to my knowledge, there's been nothing of the sort. I guess I shouldn't be too surprised. I do my best to make sure that nobody hurts my beautiful space girl. I hope you enjoyed Space Girl, as written by Ryan Peacock and performed by Evil Idol 2019 contestant number 18, Danielle Hewitt. Up next, we've got a second sinister story for you, written by author Richard Saxon and it's voiced by Evil Idol 2019 contestant number 9, Adam Dergeman. In it, we'll meet another group of students, this one out to gain some valuable real-world experience in the Arctic, on their way to earning their doctorate degrees. Everything is going as well as it can be in the Sub-Zero North. That is, until one of them notices something very, very wrong with their surroundings. Without further ado, I present to you, there were two moons in the sky last night.
Have you ever looked up at the moon at night and dreamed of a better life? Maybe wished for love or simply looked for inspiration? It's amazing, isn't it? Such a magnificent celestial body just hanging in the sky. One we've lived with since the beginning of time. Your parents, grandparents and forefathers have all been mesmerized by the beauty in the sky. They've all seen the same moon. I used to love that sight, but now I feel terrified each night as it rises, fearing that I might once again see two moons. It was a strange set of events that finally landed me in the middle of nowhere, also known as Svalbard, a small Norwegian island as close to the North Pole as people were willing to live. Inhabited by just under 3,000 people, all with an astonishing ability to speak English. Without Luke, I probably wouldn't have ended up anywhere nearly as exotic. But, as my best friend, he had pulled me into the field of biology after I'd spent years not knowing what to do with my life. Together with him and Samantha, another bright student with a passion for both nature and all fields of science, ranging from biology to astrology, we ventured into the unknown with a foolish dream of acquiring the ever so elusive doctorate degree. Our new home would be Longyearton, a perfect name for a city in the middle of the Arctic, where everything moved at a snail's pace. Polar bears, northern lights, endless winter nights and everlasting summer days. Had I not known better, I wouldn't have believed I was still on Earth. We first arrived in the beginning of August, greeted by our guide and teacher, Walter, a man who looked more like a bear than a human being. A massive, bearded Viking probably born in the snow holding a battle axe. He would ensure our safety and assist us in studying the wildlife. It was a beautiful sight, I have to admit. Despite being at the end of summer, the weather was harsh, barely rising above 40 degrees even though the sun was up for the entirety of the day. Nevertheless, there was something magical about the landscape. The midnight sun shined bright, a perfect yellow sky to keep us company the entire night as we celebrated the start of our new adventures. During the first couple of weeks, Walter was very insistent about us taking up a proper safety course while living there. Though rifles were prohibited in any settlement on the island, they were strongly recommended during research due to the dangers of polar bears being curious. As cuddly as they might seem, when you've observed them tear apart prey, completely covering their white fur and crimson stains of blood, you'll understand not to mess with them. September quickly rolled around and the midnight sun had long since disappeared. Days grew shorter and nights longer, but we enjoyed every moment together. It had become apparent that Luke had a crush on Samantha, and though I would never reveal that secret, it seemed odd to me that she hadn't noticed. Luke had always been quite shy, even though he had an overabundance of attention from the other sex being a sportsman and ridiculously attractive and all, but some darkness from his past had kept him from growing a proper confident facade. At the half-year mark of our stay, we'd already gathered a substantial amount of data for our research. Without going into too much detail, it included observing the walrus haul-out behavior, meaning when they leave the water and what they do on land. Nothing too exciting for most people, I'm sure, but we truly loved our work. It was the end of January, which meant the sun never showed itself, even during the day. Constant darkness surrounded us during that period, but at least we'd have times of bright moonlight and nautical twilight, which seemed like any late sunset. It kept us from getting the winter blues. By then, I had confronted Luke about his feelings for Samantha. They were both my closest friends, and though I wouldn't mind them getting together, I wanted to make sure nothing dramatic or childish would happen. Of course he denied it, shy as he was, but Samantha had started hinting at similar feelings for him too. Had just one of them spoken up rather than being stubborn kids, they could have been happy together. But what else could I do? 
other than poke their emotions until one of them burst. During the night, we'd driven one of the cars down to the beach. Though I had always considered a beach as a warm bunch of sand by the seaside, it was equally beautiful. Walter often accompanied us on our little drunken trips, having become more of a friend than a teacher, but he insisted that even though we had driven down there, we would walk back to our houses rather than drunk driving. He said this even though the population was so sparse that hitting anyone was almost impossible. Back at the house, we played cards and drank some home-brewed Norwegian vodka. Illegal, disgusting, but cheap, and it got the job done. Walter was probably the biggest man I'd ever laid eyes upon, but he honestly had the bladder of a small child. There's something about sub-zero temperatures that really makes you need to take a piss every 30 minutes, but since the bathroom was occupied, he ventured outside to relieve himself. Moments later, we heard him gasp. <gasps> hey, come and have a look at this, Walter called from outside. Not wanting to leave the warm comfort of my chair, I took a large sip of my drink and yelled back at him. It's cold as hell and I'm not coming outside to look at your dick. The others chuckled, more from the alcohol than my stupid statement. No, seriously, there's something wrong with the sky, Walter said. All right, coming, I said as I pushed myself up from the chair, my legs barely wanting to move after an entire day of exploration. The four of us went outside to find Walter frozen in his place, just staring up at the sky. I glanced up and immediately shared his confusion. There were two moons. We all gasped synchronously as we tried to make sense of the bizarre phenomenon in the night sky. What the hell? Luke asked. It's gotta be an optical illusion, right? For a second, I let myself believe that was the explanation. But the second moon, though equal in size and shape, had a completely different surface. It was planar, with less craters and whiter than our own. No way. They're far too far away from each other. They don't even look alike, I said. So what's your explanation then? Luke asked. Samantha who had been an astronomy aficionado since she was old enough to pronounce rocket, had remained oddly silent since we got outside. The second moon is identical to our own, she simply stated. What? It's clearly not, Luke asked, confused. No, it is really. It's just that we're looking at it from the back. It's like our moon has been rotated almost 180 degrees. Just look at the edge. I tried to see what she meant, and sure enough, the edge of the second moon had landmarks I would recognize as our own. What, so the moon split in half or something? I asked. Don't be ridiculous, Walter interjected. That's weird, but it's kind of cool, isn't it? Luke said. Cool? Or terrifying? Fuck if I know, Samantha replied. We decided that we could probably get a better view from halfway up Plateau Mountain, next to Longyearton. So we rushed, Walter bringing his camera, any kind of proof that we hadn't all just collectively gotten poisoned from the alcohol and were hallucinating. As we climbed up, we started hearing a strange noise in the distance, just vaguely at first, like an electrical humming from a generator. This will do, won't it? I asked as we were about one third up the mountain. I wasn't in the best shape of my life, and climbing up a 1300 foot mountain wouldn't be my choice for a good time. We looked back at the sky. Sure enough, the two moons lingered in the sky, both full and ever so bright. The four of us just stared in silence for what felt like an eternity, the humming turning to a buzz as we waited. Do you guys hear that? Walter finally said. The buzzing sound got louder and started to localize itself to the village. We glanced down at our neighborhood and we realized all the houses had moved around, jumbled up and unrecognizable. Colors were changed, streets turned directly into buildings, and shops had simply vanished. 
We rushed back down the mountain, but stopped before entering the village. New houses had appeared, extending the settlement to twice its normal size. Even Walter, who had lived there most of his life, couldn't find his way anymore. My house is supposed to be right here, he said, pointing to an empty piece of land a couple of hundred feet down the hill. A light appeared where Walter was pointing, undefinable at first, but it quickly took shape as Walter's home. It looked like static from an old television, but it was clearly a house. As it took shape, we could hear a faint screaming coming from inside. Shit, 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 shit. My wife is in there, Walter said as he started running towards the house. We took Chase after him. The closer we got to the obscured version of his home, the more uneasy I felt about entering it. A pit formed in my stomach, and following my instincts I attempted to stop Walter. Being twice my size, he simply pushed me away and kept running. Walter! Wait! I screamed at him, just as he passed the barrier from us to the entrance of the house. He only got halfway in before the house vanished before our eyes, taking just that part of Walter with it. He had been split down the middle, and the little part that remained of him simply fell to the ground in a pile of blood and viscera. Oh my god! Oh no! No, no! Samantha cried as she stared at Walter's mangled corpse. His face and chest had been stripped away alongside his arm. Everything that had made it past the barrier simply cut away. We couldn't even process what had just happened before we were all blinded by a flash of light. A completely new village appeared in front of us, the old one mostly stripped away from reality. Just within reach of the new village, we could hear the panicked yells from the people within. Screams of fear and agony vibrated through the air. We realized that the new village had appeared inside parts of our own, houses merging in ways not possible people stuck inside walls or cut in half by vanishing buildings. We saw one man cut in two at the waist crawling for help, his entrails pouring out as he desperately tried to keep moving, not even realizing half his body had been taken away from him. People came running away from the village, some missing legs, one woman seemingly fused with a different version of herself, joint at the head like a pair of conjoined twins. As the people neared us, we could see the true devastation of what had just happened inside the village. Houses disappeared and reappeared in new locations. Anyone unlucky enough to be in the same place was shred to pieces. One older woman was looking back at the village as she ran away and ended up colliding with me head on. I quickly bent down to help her up and she rambled on about something, only I couldn't understand what language she was speaking. It wasn't English, Norwegian, nor Russian. In fact, it didn't resemble anything I'd ever heard before. Some man was waving furiously as he passed, and even though we couldn't understand the language, we got the point. We've got to get out of here, I said. But, 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 but Walter, we, we can't just leave him here. He's dead, Samantha. Come on. Luke and I grabbed her and pulled her with us. We were all in shock with just enough basic survival instincts to flee. We ran away as fast as our legs could carry us, but I couldn't resist the urge to look back upon the nightmare we were trying to escape. One moment the village was there, and in the next a completely new configuration of houses and streets. They appeared together, merged into each other, and collapsed into a mesh of wood and concrete. The people fleeing the village seemed to have an idea where to go, so we attempted to follow them, but in another flash, they were simply deleted from existence. Oh my god, I said. Where did they go? Samantha asked. I couldn't answer that. None of us could. Things had gone downhill so fast we hadn't had half a second to wrap our minds around it. We stopped. I was starting to feel just how out of shape I was. There were no more screams coming from the village, and it seemed to mostly have settled down into an undefinable mixture of houses and corpses. Do you think it's over? Luke asked. I don't know. There are still two moons in the sky, I said. We should call someone. I left my phone back at the house. Me too. 
Despite the chaos, everything felt pretty calm after the people had vanished. We had reached higher ground, giving us a decent view over the area. The village was still morphing at its own volition, but I couldn't see any signs of life. I guess whoever failed to escape must have been dead by then. What are we going to do? Samantha asked. The car we parked at the beach, Luke said. So what? We're on an island. Where are we going to drive? The walkie-talkie will be there, and it'll be enough to keep us warm if it doesn't disappear like everything else. So basically we just avoid the inevitable? Do you have a better idea? While the two of them argued about what to do next, I kept watching the horizon. The way it lit so much brighter in the moonlight than usual was remarkably beautiful, establishing a certain calmness in the horrific landscape. Then something broke the purity of the horizon. A creature walked across it, only showing as a silhouette. First one, then two, then before I could even alert the others, there were at least three dozen large beings walking in the distance. Uh, guys? I said. They kept arguing. Guys, look! The two of them shut up long enough to notice I was pointing at the creatures. Shit, are those polar bears? Luke asked. I don't think so. They're way too big. I responded. Now we really have to head for the car. The rifles are still there. Without any better idea, we started heading for the beach. Midnight had come and gone, and the temperature dropped even further below zero. Considering the weather, the clothes we had were far from sufficient. It was a short trek through the snow, but sure enough, the car was still there, faithfully awaiting our arrival. Thank fuck for that! Samantha exclaimed in joy. We all rushed over, Samantha excitedly wrapping herself in a thicker jacket she had left in the car. Here, grab a rifle, Luke said as he handed me one of the two. I'm not the best shot, I said nervously. Doesn't matter, it's just supposed to be loud enough to scare the bears a bit. I don't think they're normal bears, man. Well, whatever the fuck they are, they're not gonna like guns. He said it with such a strange hint of confidence that didn't normally come from him. Samantha grabbed the walkie from the glove compartment. Hello? She said. You gotta end it with over, Sam? I said jokingly, trying to diffuse the tense atmosphere. Fuck off. The radio responded with static. Hello? Is there anyone there? Nothing. I'll keep trying different channels. Where are we headed next? Well, the car is dead, so we're walking. But the airport is only a couple of miles away, so I suggest we head there, Luke said. Without disagreeing, we started moving. I kept my eye on the horizon, seeing more silhouettes gathering. A few were venturing into the broken village, but they were still too far, and I couldn't fathom what the hell they were. Guys, I need a break, I said after about an hour of walking. My leg had been aching since the woman collided with me, but the cold had numbed down the pain so far. It's kind of beautiful, isn't it? Samantha said. She stood on the side of the road, staring at the sky. I had noticed it before, almost mesmerizing to see a new celestial body floating above in our sky that had remained unchanged as far back in history as anyone could remember. We were the first to see the new moon but if the world was experiencing the same freakish chaos as ourselves, then I feared we'd also be the last. After a mile, we could see the top of the air traffic control tower. No sooner before we noticed it, the whole structure collapsed to the ground, releasing an impossibly bright green light as it did. What was that? Before we could react, a loud roar fell over us. One of the creatures emerged from the darkness and stood tall in front of us. It was the exact shape of a polar bear, only larger, without any skin covering its body. All we could see was muscle and vessels pulsating across its entire being, skinned from head to toe. The face was the most horrific part of it. No eyes or ears, only a flesh-filled, mangled piece of meat with teeth sticking through in all directions. 
despite having no vision, it could somehow sense our whereabouts. It looked directly at us for a second before charging. We started running. The creature was fast, but the vibrant green light seemed to bother it enough to allow us a head start, though it didn't take long before it braved the brightness and took chase after us. Once we gained enough of a distance, I turned to fire at it. To my surprise, the shot hit it square in its face, but it barely phased it. Luke turned to do the same, but as he fired, his foot caught onto something and he fell onto the ground. Shit! He yelled. We ran over to pull him off the ground, and he fired a second shot at the creature. He hit it in the leg, causing it to stumble for a moment. It was just enough for us to get Luke back to his feet, but he was slower from the fall. Ah, uh, I think I messed up my ankle, Luke said. I took his arm over my shoulder. The creature was gaining speed again. I'm not going to make it like this. Just go, he said. You're not going to die because of a twisted ankle, you moron, Samantha insisted as she held onto his other arm. Each second, the creature got close to us. Even without Luke hanging onto us, we wouldn't be fast enough to get away. The creature reached us and knocked us all simultaneously to the ground. It reached out its deformed paw and hit Luke's shoulder. He let out a horrified scream as the claws tore through his skin. Blood immediately started dripping from the wound. All of a sudden, the creature stopped, and a large howl could be heard coming from the distance. It was distorted and rough, unlike anything I'd ever heard. I could only describe it as vaguely organic, as if some massive animal was screaming out in intense agony. Without hesitating, the creature started running in the direction of the howl, once again leaving us alone in the darkness. I collapsed to the ground under Luke's weight. He had always been far larger than myself, a typical gym rat who always bugged me to join him. Damn, Luke, you're heavy. What was that thing? He asked, out of breath. None of us knew. How could we? Everything had fallen apart, and even I was starting to believe we were in a different world altogether. The green light on the horizon still shined bright acting as an excellent beacon, taking us where we had to go. Luke was quick to get back on his feet, and he tried to act like nothing was wrong, but we could both tell he was in a great deal of pain. After a long struggle, we finally reached what remained of the airport. It wasn't an impressive sight. Only one runway and a couple of planes next to a few of the centralized buildings. It was desolate. Not another living soul seemed to have made it there. Unlike the village, the airport still looked familiar, though the tower had fallen to pieces, replaced by the blinding green light that had guided us in, a strange beacon of hope in the destruction. It simply hung in the air expectantly, waiting for something to happen. Luke collapsed to the ground as we set foot inside the main building. I don't feel right, was all he could say. It's all right, Luke. We're going to be safe here. We dragged him over to one of the office buildings that was connected to the hangar. Luke was sweating bullets. Samantha put a hand up to his forehead and checked his temperature. Luke, you're burning up. Yeah, I think something's wrong, he responded with slurred words. I'm going to check the buildings for any supplies. I'll be right back, I said. Sam, I have to tell you something. I heard Luke say as I left. I was hoping he was confessing his feelings for her, that they could have a nice moment of happiness to hold on to, because I suspected things weren't going to end well for us. By the time I had got back, I had only found a packed lunch, a half-empty bottle of water, and a flashlight, but Luke was barely awake and refused any of it. Samantha sat next to Luke and held his hand as he fell unconscious. He looked pale, already skinnier than before, as if he hadn't eaten in weeks. Something seemed to be feeding off him from the inside. How's his shoulder? I asked. It completely healed, but... But what? Look at his skin. I shone the flashlight at Luke's shoulder. There were strange bumps moving beneath the skin, pulsating. I covered up his shoulder, not wanting to think about what these things were. 
Whatever was happening, we were too ill-equipped to help him. Our only hope would be to wait for the morning and hopefully find a doctor. We should try and get some sleep. It will be easier to deal with everything during the day, I said. We huddled up closer around Luke. Even inside, it was barely above zero. Exhausted, we quickly fell asleep. I awoke to Samantha screaming. I shot quickly to my feet and fumbled around for the flashlight. As I shone the light at her, I could see that she was embraced by dozens of thin, black tendrils, all emerging from Luke's left arm and shoulder. Luke's eyes had been punctured, black liquid seeping out from the holes, and his chest had been torn open, revealing his lung, infested with thousands of tiny black worms crawling around inside. He was beyond dead, but to my horror he was still moving. I pulled out my knife and swung at the tendrils around Samantha. They were elastic and it took all the force I had to cut through them, one by one, until Samantha was finally free. Luke screamed in agony, only it wasn't his voice. As the tendrils retracted back into his arm, new ones shot out, immediately replacing the broken ones. I grabbed Samantha's arms and told her to run. She took Luke's rifle off the ground and we ran past him and shoved him to the ground. It only slowed him down for a second before he followed. The tendrils kept him off the ground and pulled his body along with them. We ran into a small storage room and shut the door behind us. Luke smashed into the door at full force, opening it just enough to let the tendrils slither inside. I cut them down as Samantha tried to hold the door shut. You have to shoot it! I yelled at her. B but it's Luke! She stuttered back. No, it isn't! Not anymore! She looked at me with terror in her eyes, but she knew what she had to do. I'm going to open the door, I said. She nodded. At the count of three, I pulled open the door, and Luke stumbled inside. His face had been split in half down the middle, allowing thousands of tiny black maggots to pour out from the head. Shoot! I yelled. Samantha fired off a shot and hit him square in the neck. Mixed with the damage from the worms, his head tore from his torso and fell to the ground. He stumbled, but remained standing. I slashed at him with my knife and cut him even further apart, trying to at least keep him at bay. Sam, you've got to get out of here! She didn't listen, but I couldn't see what she was doing. I could hear her rummage through some cans and equipment behind me. I'm not fucking leaving you! She said as she emptied out the container of whatever she had found over Luke some of it splashing over onto my face. I could smell the vapors. It was gasoline. The creature slipped on a mix of its own worms and gas and had fallen to the ground. I took the opportunity to get away. I dug a lighter out of my pocket and carefully lit it, hoping the drops of gasoline on myself wouldn't ignite. I threw the lighter at Luke and he immediately engulfed in flames. The worms screeched as they burned to pieces thousands of tiny burning monstrosities crawling around, lighting up everything around them. The fire spread so quickly, faster than I thought it would be possible, and before we could even get out of the way, we were surrounded on all sides. The only exit had already started to burn, and I knew then we were going to die, with no hope of escape. We embraced each other during our final moments and just prayed it would be over quickly that the smoke would suffocate us before the fire could reach us. Coughing from the smoke, I dared to take a peek at the flames. The whole hangar was starting to collapse, and within a minute of starting the flame, the roof fell on top of us. Just before passing out, I saw the bright green light looming over us, and at its center, I could see the image of a different world, one not destroyed and inhabited by horrific creatures. Then everything, turned dark. A voice called out to me, bringing me back from the depths of unconsciousness. The voice was unfamiliar, speaking in Norwegian. I couldn't understand half of it, but I knew he was asking if I was okay. I opened my eyes and was hit by the dim light of day. Even during the Arctic night, the mornings were still bright enough to tell the difference. Where's Samantha? was all I could say. Oh, you're English. You mean the girl you were with? Yeah, she's fine. What happened to you two? The man bombarded me with questions, but 
I remained silent, still too weak to think properly. The man pointed to a stretcher carrying Samantha. They had put on an oxygen mask, but she seemed mostly awake, with only minor bruises and some smoke inhalation. The airport had been fully restored, not even a hint of destruction from the previous night, and no sign of a second moon remained. We had to spend the next week at their local clinic, trying our best to answer their questions about how we got hurt, and how we managed to get inside the hangar in the middle of the night, and how we had both suffered pretty severe damage from smoke inhalation, despite having no reported fire on the island. Of course, when we recounted the events we had suffered through, they brushed it off to confusion after a head trauma, or that we had just gotten our hands on some nasty drugs. Everything seemed fine in the city. Nothing had seemingly changed and life went on. We asked if they had found Luke's body, if they had found anyone we knew at all. But there was no record of Luke, nor Walter even setting foot on Svalbard in the last month. I called home, and though my family was happy to hear from me, they couldn't remember if I ever had a friend named Luke. The only proof I had that I hadn't gone insane was that Samantha's memory of everything matched mine. As night approached, Samantha sat by the window staring into the darkening sky. Even with eternal darkness, the moon still sets and rises. We both counted the seconds in terrified anticipation. Only one moon ever emerged from the horizon, and I let out a sigh of relief as I saw it. Samantha did not share my enthusiasm. I asked her what was wrong, and she only pointed at it without speaking a word. I looked up into the sky and studied the moon. At first it seemed perfectly normal, and to the untrained eye, everything appeared to be fine. But the more I stared at it, the more I noticed the differences. The landmarks didn't match, and the color palette was slightly off. Samantha looked at me with terror in her eyes and confirmed what we both knew were true. That was not our moon. I hope you enjoyed There Were Two Moons in the Sky Last Night, as written by Richard Saxon and performed by Evil Idol 2019 contestant number 9, Adam Dergeman. Up next, we've got one final round of fearsome fiction for you, written by author Laura Lee and performed by Evil Idol 2019 contestant number 8, A.J. Ferraro. In it, a woman's life is turned upside down when her spouse returns from overseas. His doctors tell her that he may never be the same. But what if it's not his, but her behavior that we ought to worry about? Without further ado, I present to you, My Husband Came Back From The War. My husband went overseas as part of the military for a few years. The entire time I anxiously awaited his return, I constantly wondered if I would ever get a phone call notifying me that he would never come home. It was strange being alone in this big house for so long, but... I got by. As the end of his tour neared, my days were consumed with preparation. Everything had to be in perfect order for him. It had to be just right. In an unexpected twist of fate, I did get a call, a week before he was scheduled to return. My husband wasn't dead, but he was very badly hurt. I didn't want the gruesome details, but he lost his legs and suffered a bad head injury. They told me to expect changes in his memory and behavior when he came back. They explained that recovery was a long road, that he'd need lots of support from me, and a lot of other stuff I'm sure they've told to countless spouses waiting back at home. Even knowing all this, nothing could prepare me for what was coming. By the time I was finally going to be able to see him, I'd practically picked my fingers raw from anxiety. He had to be medically stable enough to ship back, so I wasn't expecting the worst, but I clearly wasn't expecting the best either. I was scheduled to meet him at a doctor's appointment so they could go over all the details with me. I've never been fond of hospitals, 
or doctors or anything like that. So this certainly wasn't how I wanted to see my husband for the first time. My anxiety was debilitating, but I knew he needed me. So I swallowed my apprehensions and urged myself through the doors. I signed in, and the doctor met me in the office soon after. He gave me essentially the same basic rundown I'd heard before. I would notice deviations in my husband's personality. He'd probably forget some things. He had made a lot of progress, but there was still a long ways to go in terms of both physical and mental recovery. I tried to pay attention, but I was so nervous to see him that his words all seemed to blur together. The doctor stopped abruptly to knock on one of the doors stretched along the hallway. Mr. Hart, I have your wife here. I'm sure you're very excited to see her. He flashed me a big smile before opening the door and ushering me into the room. He looked just like I remembered just like all the big glossy pictures that lined the hallways of the house, with the exception of his lower half. He sat in a wheelchair now, and both legs had been amputated above the knee. The wounds are pretty healed up now. The bandages are just to keep the swelling down in preparation for future prosthetic fitting, the doctor reassured me. My husband looked up at me, disoriented and confused. His expression rapidly morphed into a look of rage. That's not my fucking wife, he said, glaring up at me. My heart seized in my chest. Honey, I started to say. The doctor cut me off. Ryan, this is your wife. She provided ID at the front desk. Just look at her. You know this is your wife. You just showed me a picture of you two 20 minutes ago. He turned to me, a sorry expression on his face. I heard he had trouble telling the nurses apart in rehab, and he still gets confused sometimes. This is actually pretty normal. It'll get better as you talk to him. Remind him of all the memories you shared before all of this happened. My husband still looked skeptical, but I could tell he was at least somewhat aware of how his brain injury had affected him. He knew he wasn't all there anymore. The doctor educated me on how I could care for my husband and make sure he was safe around the house. It was a lot to remember, but I took careful notes. Finally, I was allowed to take him home. I sheepishly gripped the handles of his wheelchair and pushed him out of the office. I helped him transfer into the passenger side of my car before getting into the driver's side. I missed you, I finally cautioned after several heavy minutes of silence. Yeah, I missed you too, he replied, looking at me with a glimmer of recognition. I eased up a bit in my seat, hardly realizing I'd been tensing my entire body. I hit the brakes a bit too hard as we approached a red light. We both lurched forward in our seats, straining against the seatbelts. Sorry, babe, I offered meekly. Brakes are a little touchy. You've had this car for years, he shot back, turning to look out the window. I know, just haven't been driving much lately. I returned with a sigh. I knew it was going to be difficult to get him to trust me. It's only gotten worse in the weeks since he's been back. The doctor has been no help. Every time I call, he writes my husband's erratic behavior off as a normal reaction to traumatic brain injury and probable PTSD. There are moments when he responds to logic, admitting that I must be his wife because I look exactly like he remembers. We flip through photo albums together each day and laugh over our shared memories. I fill in the gaps when he's forgotten something. We hold hands, and sometimes he even initiates a kiss. If I happen to forget the smallest detail he remembers, or thinks he remembers really, a switch flips, and I know the chance for reasoning with him is gone. He can't seem to accept that it's normal for me to forget things too. Even more frustrating is this constant nitpicking over the small ways I've changed over the years. After spending so much time alone in this house, naturally I've picked up a few new hobbies. My husband can't come to terms with this fact, expressing disbelief in my sudden love of gardening the most. You fucking hate the dirt, he snaps at me. You hate the way it feels under your nails. I still do, I reply, trying to keep my composure. Be patient, the doctor always says. That's why I wear gloves, honey. I like the feeling of growing something out of nothing. 
I get to plant my favorite flowers instead of buying them for the vases like I used to. Sometimes things are good, but most of the time they aren't. It truly is one step forward and two steps back. Sometimes it feels like 20. The doctor says he's likely projecting. He feels so out of control of his own life that he needs to control mine. Be patient, he always says as we end a phone call, and I scream internally each time. My husband wakes up screaming almost every night. Sometimes he lets me comfort him. Sometimes he won't. I know this is hard for him. He will often say something like, I don't fucking get it. Logically, I know you are my wife. You have her eyes, her smile, her everything. You know everything about her, everything about us. God, what the hell is wrong with me? I know he's broken, but I can fix him. He is fundamentally different now, but I can build a life with this new man once he lets me in. Today is actually going pretty well. We laughed over coffee this morning, and he kissed me on my way out to buy some more bulbs for the empty patch in my garden. I've spent most of the day running errands since I'm not able to get out much lately. I even stopped at the local winery to pick up my husband's favorite red. It will go perfectly with his favorite meal, which I'm planning to cook tonight. I try to guard my feelings these days, but I actually feel good today. That's why my heart sinks when my husband greets me from the kitchen. That god-awful phrase again. You're not my fucking wife. Tears are streaming down his face, and he's holding an old family photo of me in one hand. He's not just angry. He's devastated. I move towards him, ready to embrace him and give him the speech that is actually starting to convince him that yes, I am his fucking wife. Babe, please. You know who I am. No, babe, I don't. You aren't my fucking wife, he shouts, completely out of touch and beyond reason. It's at this point that I notice he's also holding his gun, low in his lap, pointed at me. Ryan, listen. I firm my tone, approaching him slowly. You don't know what you're saying. You get confused. You know this. His expression softens, and so does mine. He looks down for a moment. When he returns his gaze to meet mine, his features have contorted into the most deranged and savage look I've ever seen. He aims and shoots. I brace myself, eyes closing instinctively, and hear the bullet speed past me. It burrows deep into the wall. His poor spatial perception, another effect of the head injury, has saved my life. Terrified for my life, my primal survival instincts take over. In his confusion, I rush him with a knife resting on the counter. I plunge it deep into his chest over and over again. Anger and frustration and disappointment bubble up and magnify my fear response. I already hear the sirens wailing in the distance by the time I'm done. In this neighborhood, police arrive immediately when neighbors report shots fired. The police find me hysterical on the kitchen floor. I know my husband is dead, but the EMTs work on him anyway. After the EMTs clear me, the police take me in for questioning. Luckily, it's a pretty open and shut case of self-defense. They consider his condition. His doctor confirms that I have called countless times about his erratic behavior. They find gunshot residue on my deceased husband's hands. The neighbors confirm they heard him shouting at me before the shot was fired. They called because they feared for my safety. And so, they let me go. Back to that empty house again. I feel like a completely changed woman as I enter those doors. I make my way back to the kitchen, floor still bloodied by the struggle, and drop onto the ground. And then I laugh. Just fucking laugh. Because of course this would happen to me. My life has been nothing but struggle, fighting to get by, and yeah, killing when I needed to. Nothing has ever gone my way. I've worked myself half to death, but my sister had everything handed to her. None of that ever came my way, of course. She was too much of a stingy bitch to ever think about me. 
So when she finally reached out to me after all these years, and I found she'd married rich, was sitting pretty in this mansion while I slaved every day away just to afford the measly rent on my barely legal apartment, I just lost it. I mean, why shouldn't I take something for myself? Just this once. I mean, nobody, not even my sister, ever showed me any mercy. It was my turn. Her husband didn't even know about me. I was an embarrassment to her. Her failure of a twin sister. I think I just reminded her of what could have been. The miserable life she could have led if things went just slightly different for her. I spent the following months praying that Ryan would die overseas. I analyzed every last picture in the house. I pored over her diaries. She was so self-absorbed that she wrote down everything that happened to her. A bitch made it so easy to assume her identity that I couldn't believe it took me this long to kill her. I guess the sentimental old cow actually kept a picture of the two of us hidden away. That's what Ryan found, what finally sent him over the edge into attempted murder. I almost feel bad for him, but mostly I'm so infuriated that he couldn't just let me have this one thing for once. Why couldn't he just let me be happy? I was trying so fucking hard. I took care of him day and night. I spent so much time trying to get to know him, but he couldn't be bothered to put in any effort to do the same for me. Hell, I don't even like men, but I was still willing to give him a chance instead of just doing him in right away like I did to dear old sis. Somehow, I still couldn't measure up to my perfect fucking sister, even when I was her. I laugh so hard my eyes well up with tears and my stomach aches. I reach into a cabinet and retrieve that damn picture. The picture that broke the illusion. I managed to shove it in there as soon as I was finished with Ryan. I push myself up off the floor and walk weakly over to the stove. I flick the burner on and let that damn photograph burn. I gather the ashes of the last hint of my miserable old life in my hands and walk through the beautiful French-style doors onto the sprawling and perfectly fucking manicured backyard. I spread the ashes of myself, the self I don't want to be anymore, onto my beloved garden. I smile down at the beautiful bunches of hyacinths bursting up from the fertile ground. It was so kind of me to plant my sister's favorite flowers atop the pieces of her dead body. I hope you enjoyed My Husband Came Back From The War, as written and performed by Evil Idol 2019 contestant number 8, AJ Ferraro. Thank you for listening and for joining us tonight for this episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Don't forget, all of tonight's performances were featured in the third round of our ongoing Evil Idol 2019 Horror Voice Acting Competition, hosted on our official Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel now. If you enjoyed the performances tonight, visit our YouTube channel and check out the other fantastic entries in the competition. And don't forget to participate by voting in the fourth round, starting mid-May. Again, you can find Chilling Tales for Dark Nights in the Evil Idol competition on YouTube. Just search Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube on any search engine. Or visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click the Evil Idol link on the navigation to see a current roster, contestant profiles, and links to all of the performances thus far. We and the candidates appreciate your support. Also as a reminder, Take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. And to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs> Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Thanks for joining us. 
You've been listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, a production of Chilling Entertainment and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted by yours truly, Steve Taylor. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Roshek. Logo by Craig Roshek. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? We take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to us. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories including those you've heard on this program. We'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>